Hi, welcome to LPC Online. I'm Pastor Doug and I wanna thank you for joining us today, especially those who are watching for the first time. If you'd like to connect with us, you can go to our website, listdualpc.com and leave us a message. We really hope that God uses this time to help you grow in your faith and be encouraged.
that we could never forget what you've done for us. Lord, we are amazed at the way that you've cared for us and how you've guided and led us. Even in circumstances where we had no idea of where to turn, Lord, you've still brought confidence to our hearts to know that you would be with us and that you would never fail us. So thank you, God. Continue that in our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated then. Several weeks ago, I, I shared on one of the, the fruit of the Spirit, which was love, and I thought, well, I should continue with uh, some of the aspects of the fruit of the Spirit because it's an important part of, of what we need in our lives, especially the time that we're living in right now. It's a very stressful time. I was thinking about it, and we're almost coming up to an anniversary of the one year of when they began the initial lockdown with the COVID-19. And uh, it's been one year, and, and during that period of time, there's been many times of stress, stress with our schools, stress with our, our, our leadership in terms of when to decide what to do and how to be able to do it. And I'm sure that you've had stress as well, stress in relating to whether you're actually going to be able to continue to have a job, uh, stress as to what, how you're going to be able to provide for yourselves. And so our world has been in that place. And uh, I, I was reading something on the internet. You can get just about anything from the internet, can't you? And so in there, it was talking about how you know that you are stressed. And here's a few of the things that, uh, that uh, I, I came across. And uh, one of them says, I'm just going to put an out-of-order sticker on my forehead and call it a day. <laughs> the second one I, I read, it says, I get a headache, take two aspirins, and keep away from children, just like the bottle says. <laughs> Uh, for, third one I had is I realized that stress spelled backwards is desserts and wonder if it is a coincidence. I think not. And then this is the definition. This isn't really that funny, but it's from a fellow by the name of Dan Zay Pace. He defined it this way. Stress is the trash of modern life. 
We all generate it, but if you don't dispose of it properly, it will pile up and overtake your life. And that is true. And I feel that that is what's been happening in our society. It's been overtaking our lives, the stress that we are living under. Stress in the way of how you respond. I'm, I still haven't gotten to the, to the place where I can go into a store and remember to have taken my mask. Uh, Jane reminds me, so I'm thankful for that, but often I'll be on my own, and I get about halfway to the door, and I realize, okay, I, I need a mask. So you go back to the car, get the mask, and away you go. it still hasn't become a habit, even though we've been doing it for a year. And so there's just some things that create a level of stress in our, in our hearts and lives. And uh, I, I have a quiz for you this morning, and, and I want you to uh, um, fill in the blank on this quiz. I'll say part of it, and uh, you think about what it is, and, th- and then we'll, we'll uh, go through it. I've, I've got five of them. So it's this, this is the first one. I'm ready to throw in the... Towel, that's right. So if you had towel, give yourself a check mark. That was right. I'm at the end of my rope, right? So, so again, something else that is relating to a, a stressful level that is, I'm just a bundle of nerves. My life is falling hard, and I feel like resigning from the human. No wonder English is so confusing, isn't it? These are colloquialisms, so that if English is not your first language, you're probably wondering, what in the world does it mean I'm at the end of my rope? Well, the truth is, is that it's an analogy to the fact that if you're coming down a rope and you get to the end, and there's still more space, and you're going to drop a certain distance, you're at the end of your rope. In other words, that's a level of stress that's going on in your life, and and people have been feeling that, I believe, during this last year that they feel that perhaps I've gotten to the end of my rope only to find out that, hey, I need a whole lot more rope to be able to get through what I'm going through. And so, we got, so if you got five out of five, you may be living in that place described or you've been there before by that definition that uh, I read earlier, the stress is the trash of modern life. From Galatians 5 in the uh, portion of Scripture that uh, Don read for us this morning, thanks for doing that, Don, that was great. Uh, In verse 22, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And it's that peace that I wanted to look at. Because God always has an answer for life's challenges. And we see it in John 14 and 27. It says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Jesus was saying this to his disciples, but he was also saying it to us. It was recorded in the word of God so that we would be able to receive that word and know that it can be applied into our lives in the same way. That not only did what the disciples receive, ultimately when Jesus died on the cross and we rose again, When he returned to the Father, he sent the Holy Spirit so that he is with us and so that our hearts do not need to be troubled. Even though in our fleshly side of us, there will be that that comes, but God has has intended for us to be able to have that peace, the peace I leave with you. In other words, his peace is not the peace that I have. I get to enjoy his peace in my life. And there's certain things that we need to do in order to be able to ensure that we receive the full peace that God has for us. So that we are able to uh, uh, not be troubled by the things that have been going on and to not be afraid. You see, the Bible talks about really two types of peace. There's an outward peace that you see from Zechariah 9 and 10. It says, he will proclaim peace to the nations. And so that peace is really an absence of conflict and war and all the other stuff that goes on. And it's an outward thing that takes place. But I'm talking about the inward peace. And so this isn't the absence of war, but it's an inward settledness that we have to know that God is at work. We may not be able to uh, fully understand it, but from Galatians 5, it is described then as the fruit of the Spirit. It's not something that we can can do ourselves, but when we invite Jesus Christ into our lives, he sends his Holy Spirit to be with us so that that fruit 
would be able to abound in our hearts and lives. And there's a number of things. There's nine of them that is available to us. And so we're not like apple trees that only produce apples. We, we produce nine different fruits. And so we have the ability then to apply into every situation the fruit that is necessary for that situation. Some situations require love to abound. Others may require it for peace or patience. And I'm going to talk about patience next week as well because we're going through difficulty that way. But you see, there's certain qualities about fruit that are important for us to understand. First of all, fruit is natural. Every healthy thing produces fruit. When you look at uh, the stuff that we are going to be doing, farmers are going to be doing in uh, the next number of months when they plant uh, uh, stuff into the ground. And, and if you have an orchard, you're expecting that you'll see blooms and hopefully we don't have frost so that the blooms will grow. And ultimately, there will be fruit that comes if it is something that is, it, it, it is a natural thing for an apple tree to have apple fruit. For wheat to produce wheat kernels, for, uh, uh, sp- um, I was going to say spaghetti squash. I don't know why that sprung into my mind. I, I've, lear- I've learned to enjoy spaghetti squash. It's, it's great stuff. But if from that spaghetti, from that seed, then you're going to have that squash that comes. There, it's, it needs to be a natural thing. And so once we have the Holy Spirit joined to our spirit, it will be part of the natural life of the spirit. And so that you are able to, not that we won't have the challenges, but in the middle of them, we will have a peace that we won't be able to understand when everything may seem to be falling apart around us. And so it doesn't actually remove us from the challenge, but what it does is it puts a settledness in our hearts so that we know that we can trust God to take us through whatever that challenge is. Isn't that an amazing thing? I am so thankful to God that he provides us with a way. But, and it's a natural thing that produces. You see, a healthy uh, plant produces fruit, but an unhealthy uh, uh, fruit does not. It it's, produces very little or something that is inferior. And often the lack of fruit is an indicator of the plant's health level. If we don't have fruit... It's an indication of whether we are actually doing everything and being what everything God created us to be able to be. And it's the truth for us as a church. There needs to be fruit that comes from us as a collective and from every other church that's here in this town and across our province, that there needs to be fruit that abounds. And being a Pentecostal, I've been expecting fruit to come like that. But in the time that I've been here on this earth, I've actually seen it diminish. In other words, there's something that's robbing the fruit that our church should be producing. Now, we do a little bit, there's a little bit, but the the truth is is we're not, as a fellowship, as a Pentecostal fellowship, and you look at the statistics, we're not keeping up with the birth rate of Canada. In other words, there are more people that are born into our country than are coming to know Jesus Christ through any church, not just ours as well. As a matter of fact, there are those that are drifting away. There's something that's robbing it and is causing that fruit not to be produced, not only in us, but also to be able to harvest the fruit that is out there in the lives and the souls of the people of Tilsonburg. There is fruit. There are those that are out there that God is looking for us. He's given us that capacity and the responsibility. That's why you built this building. It's not so that you have a nice place to come on Sunday. It's so that others would join you and that we're able to bring people into the knowledge of Jesus Christ and to be able to bear fruit for him. You see, it's what he does, though, but we have to be prepared to do our part. You see, the roots, they don't bear the fruit. But the roots are important because when they are strong, then we know that the nourishment that is necessary to produce the fruit on the top gets there. And so we may not necessarily see that, but we just need to be strong in the Lord. The second thing that I noticed about the quality of fruit is that it takes time to develop and grow. Therefore, the peace we may be looking for may require time and experience to be assured that we don't need to worry or fret. You see, it's not something that you can say, well, I'm glad that I've got peace and just, that's it. 
You see, peace only comes at the times when we are in the most difficult circumstances. Peace doesn't come when everything's going well. Sure, you may have peace, but the problem is it's not the real peace. It's not that deep down settledness to know that God is at work. But when we're going through the difficult time, just like we are right now with this COVID-19, we know that God is at work in the midst of it. And we may not see it, but I'm trusting that from this, that we would produce fruit, fruit that would come to know him as Lord and Savior. People from your families, people from your community, people from my community as well. But it takes time and growth for it to happen. As soon as you plant that wheat seed, it doesn't produce a harvest right away. As a matter of fact, it requires a whole bunch of things to go on in order for it to get to the place where you're able to harvest it. And as we are going through this time of development and growth as a church, and so when you look for your new leader coming, that's the whole purpose of of having that leadership here to be able to produce the fruit and to bring us to the place that we contribute to be able to see it come. And this... And the last thing I, I thought of in terms of that produces the quality of fruit is that fruit takes tending. It just doesn't happen automatically. Sure, you can get a few apples, but if you see a tree that has been neglected, the apples that are on it compared to one that is within an orchard is far less, and the quality of it is far less than what the, an orchard uh, farmer would receive. You see, as plants grow and are healthy, they will produce that fruit. However, every gardener or uh, anyone, a farmer, uh, they need to know that to get the best fruit, the plant needs to be, first of all, pruned. (laughs) Isn't that a crazy thing when you think about it? That you cut off the stuff from from, from, uh, the, the plant so that it'll produce more fruit. Jesus talks about that in John 15, doesn't he? He talks about being part of the vine and that uh, the vine dresser trims the vine in order to produce more. And so sometimes we think, well, the difficulties and there may be a pruning that goes on in our lives and we say, well, Lord, what's, what's this all about? But the truth is, is that he's working on us so that we are able to be ready to produce what the fruit is that we need to produce. You see, it, it requires watering, It requires sunlight in order for it to to come about. It needs to be fed. In other words, the farmer needs to put fertilizer down as well and to be able to cultivate it and tend it. He needs to make sure that there's not other things that are there to be able to choke out. And if you look at the province and the country that we are in, there have been a lot of weeds that are choking out what God intended for us to do. When you look statistically, the things that have been choking out that with outside within our society is similar to what's been going on in churches as well. And I say, Lord, help us. We need to be different. We need to get to the place that we are able to produce the joy and the peace and the love so that others will see it and they will come and they will want it as well and that their lives... You see, the fruit of peace is based on decisions that we make and not how we feel. The more often we decide to be peaceful, the, the more the fruit grows in our life so that we need to practice the presence of God because that's where peace comes from. We need to practice having God's presence with us. And I know for many of you, if you're driving in your car, you'll have worship music on or you'll take time to pray, keep your eyes open when you're driving, but if you're sitting there, you can close them. But the, the truth is, is that you, you, you're ushering in that presence of God. He comes when, when you invite him in. He doesn't stay away. All we need to say is, Jesus, Jesus, come holy Jesus. Fill this place with your presence, oh God. The number one reason why people come to church is to experience the presence of God. Because people long for it. It's something that's built into us innately. We want to come. That's why it's, it's nice to be at home and you can sense the presence of God there in your home. But when we come together like this as well, there's something different about that. Because his presence comes and it unites our hearts together and makes us as one in him. 
And so I'm thankful for the presence of God. I wouldn't want to come to church if God wasn't here. We'd just be a club. And I have no intention or desire to be part of a club. As much as I like you folks and and I'm thankful for your lives. But the truth is, I'm here to see God. I'm here to experience his presence. He is here. He is here. All things are possible because Jesus is here. And do we really believe that? I trust that you do. I believe it in my heart and that when Jesus is here, that it takes everything that may seem like an impossible task, and now all of a sudden it becomes possible. The fruit comes from that Holy Spirit. That is why Jesus could say in John 14 that he was giving us his peace to the disciples due to his Holy Spirit being sent. He knew that the Holy Spirit, another member of the, uh, uh, the Godhead, that he was going to be sent to be able to join with us in our spirit so that we were able to have that peace that he could give. So what keeps us from walking in peace? Well, the definition, freedom from disturbance or tranquility is what I read from a, a dictionary. In other words, it, you can while away an hour or two in peace and seclusion. And similar words are calm or restful, freedom from interference, and so on. But you want to know something? that This fruit of peace is far different from that. This fruit of peace is something that is deep down within our hearts that can only come from God. You cannot conjure this up. You can not go, I'm going to have peace. I'm going to have... It doesn't happen that way, folks. People may think it does, but it doesn't bring us not a true deep peace that we can only get from God. Whenever our soul is out of rest, it is also out of peace. And our soul is out of peace when we are angry or discontent, when we become disturbed, when we have blocked goals, when we have frustration or worry, when we're fearful or anxious, paranoid or distressed. So what I was mentioning about the stress, it's that stress that can rob the peace from our hearts. But the truth is, is that God wants to bring the peace to be able to, to be able for us to be able to handle the stress. Stress is always going to be there. There always needs to be some level of stress in your life or you wouldn't get up in the morning. There always needs to be some level of stress for us to do the things because those are the things that God has put into our hearts and, our, and, and into us to be able to help us, to motivate us to do the things. But when we have too, an excess stress, God says, I want to take that upon me. It is not your burden it is mine. Place your yoke upon me, and I will lift it from you. And so we're thankful that God has provided us with a way. And there's a lot of these emotions that have been going on in the hearts of people. If you've been in some stores lately, or if you've, if you've been in, and there are people that are upset about the fact you've got to wear a mask, and so they are frustrated and angered because of it. I'm not... I'm not saying anything, I'm not happy about it neither, but you can see that it's gotten to a point where it angers them having to do it. And there's a level of frustration that is there because sometimes it it's just becomes overwhelming to us. But you see, the world wisdom would teach that peace is really found in fearlessness. If I'm fearless, then I'm going to have... It's not true. Peace is found in purity of heart. If I've got a clean thoughts and everything. No, peace doesn't come because of how we think. Or if we have perseverance in acquiring wisdom and in practicing something like yoga or that, that we're going to have a peace. That, it's not true. If we do charitable things, it will bring peace. To our, no, it doesn't bring peace to your heart. When we have performed certain holy rites, no, it doesn't bring peace. There's only one person and that is Jesus that really brings peace into our hearts. You see, God has called us to be peacemakers. James 3, 17 to 18 says, But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, good fruit, impartial, and sincere. And then verse 18, Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. That is what God has called us to be, is that we are to be peacemakers. 
We're not to be peacekeepers. You see, peacekeepers are trying to maintain something that is very fragile. I keep losing this. uh, Let me put that on properly. As it is man's attempt to maintain something that can only come from God. Peacekeeping is trying to keep something that we think we've put in place. There's been a a peaceful accord. You see, the Canadian Armed Forces are often called upon to maintain peace in countries who have negotiated a truce of peace, but it is not something that is fully embraced because outward peace can only be maintained if there is an inward peace. We need that inward peace, and there's only one place and where it can come from, and that's God through the Spirit. From 1 Corinthians 7.15, it says, God has called us to live in peace. And from 1 Corinthians 14 and 33, for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. You see, God is going to provide that for us. That God is going to give us the peace. And so as Canadian forces, as they try to keep peace in a country... It's almost like a a mini war that goes on because because of the struggle. People are trying, they still have the emotion upset. They haven't got to a place where they're able to lay stuff aside where a peacemaker brings the peace and it comes from the inside by the Spirit of God. That's what God's wanting us to be. Sometimes we live in circumstances where there is great stress and little peace in the relationships we have. And during this COVID-19, we've seen reports and and that the percentages of of home abuse and things of that nature, husbands and wives or or, uh, parents and kids and so on, because of the stress of us being uh, put together. And so sometimes we try to keep peace in relationships. However, one partner will try to keep the peace in the family by always submitting to the whatever that dysfunction might be, and can possibly become an enabler then of the dysfunction, and always bowing away from the confrontation. But there is no right or wrong way to approach situations like this, as everyone is different. The only way is to be able to pray and to call on the name of Jesus. That is my indicator of how the relationship is going between Jane and I in our home. And it was like this when when my boys lived at home, and it's been a long time since they lived at home, but, but if, there was pe- if there was no peace in the house, I knew that somebody else was there creating havoc. And so I would actually take oil, and I would go around, and I would anoint my doorposts in my home. I would anoint the window frames, and I would pray the peace of God over my home. And invariably... God comes. The peace returns. The things that have been creating the conflict between either it would be Jane or I or between my sons and us, we, we would see that all of a sudden all that kerfuffle stopped. Why? Because into our home, whenever we invite things that are not of God, and it can happen real easy because we bring issues home from work or whether issues home from other relationships that we may have, or you may have visitors that come that bring relationships, and it's like a spiritual residue gets left. And when you do not have the peace of God, you know that the enemy is at work. Because it's not flesh and blood that we wrestle against. It's principalities. It's spiritual things. And when we take spiritual authority then it sets us free to be able to live in the peace that God intended. Now, many of these homes where you hear about the abuse and so on, often it's not centered around Christ anyway within the home. So until you get there, you're never going to be able to live in the full peace. But if peace, people could live in my home for a while and experience the peace that Jane and I have together, they would say, boy, we would like this. Because it is a peaceful time. When we go home, we're able to relax. We're able to enjoy one another's company. There's no conflicts. There's no uh, bickering. There's no little jabs. There's no... We are able to live in peace. And that is what God intended for us.
So when we pray for God's help, he is the only one who can change a life. It's interesting, as we've come together, when you look at South Africa and the apartheid that was there, and you look at what is going on or had been going on in Ireland, it's interesting that, that the two countries, their churches, faced it in different ways. You see, with, in Ireland, there was always the conflict between the Anglicans and the Catholics. God never intended for us to war against each other. And so trying to bring a resolve in that country took years and years, and I'm not even sure if it's still resolved. But when you look at South Africa, when they were beginning to bring about a resolution to that apartheid, the church leaders said, hey, we need to get together and we need to pray. And as they prayed, the apartheid and the decision to be able to bring that country together came in such a peaceful way because, you see, it was a spiritual problem. Much of what we face in the world today is not a human problem. It's a spiritual problem that humans get wrapped up in. God never intended for us to have the conflicts that we have around the world. He wants us to be in peace, but the enemy of our soul, he has a plan. And he's trying to destroy and bring uh, disunity. He's trying to bring discord. He's trying to bring uh, anything that would destroy the peace that God has. So here's, there's three keys I want to leave with you. First of all, is that we need to accept God's pardon. From Romans 1, 5, and 6, it says, Through him we receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. It's amazing when you read what Paul went through and the call that was on his life was to be able to reach the Gentiles, which is us, with the message of Jesus, and that we are able to receive that pardon. When we are out of harmony with God, then we cannot have peace. And I'm talking about the internal peace. But when we come into unity, you see, because guilt is the number one cause of stress, according to doctors. We are unable to live up to the standards imposed by ourselves, by our spouse, by our parents, by our boss, sometimes even by God, because we think, well, we got to live in a certain way. But you see, it's not having to live in a certain way. It's so that we're able to receive the blessing of peace by doing the things that God asks us to do. See, when we come to Christ in faith, believing, and we make that invitation, we are immediately justified as if we had never sinned. And we are brought into that relationship with him. Then the standard we need to live by, live a good life, has now been removed because we cannot do it on our own. It's not what I do, it's what Christ does through me. I just need to be submitted to him. And the peace of God would come into my heart and those around me. Because the the standard that he has set is too difficult for us to live. But Christ is now the new standard for our lives. Isn't that amazing? So folks out there, some of you that don't go to church anymore other than perhaps to watch it online, you're saying, well, it's too too hard of a standard to live by. Well, God doesn't want us to live up to a standard. He wants us to live up to him. And he is the standard, the things that we do in him. And God has a plan and a purpose. And people get off track from what God has planned for us. You see, Christ is now that new standard for our lives. We may still sin. In other words, we may not meet the standard, but Christ is faithful to forgive us of those misses when we confess them and walk in Christ. That is the sanctification. When I invite Jesus Christ into my life, that is justification. As if I didn't sin, immediately I'm justified before God. But it's that sanctification that God helps us to be able to walk out so that we learn just what Jesus had intended for the blessing to be in our lives. Isn't that amazing? And so we need to accept his pardon. Because in Micah 7 and 18, it says, Who is a God like you, 
who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance. You do not stay angry forever, but you delight to show mercy. And so Jesus Christ has shown us, and God has shown us, mercy through his son Jesus. A clear conscience is unattainable unattainable until we accept God's pardon and his unconditional forgiveness. You see, there's no conditions about God's forgiveness. The only condition is that I say, Lord, forgive me. That's it. As soon as I invite Jesus Christ to do that, it sets me free so that I'm able to live in the peace that God intended. The second thing is to recognize God's presence. And I said this earlier, and it's from Matthew 28, 19 to 20. It says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You see, God asked his followers to make disciples from every nation. We knew that they could do that that they could do that because he would be with them always. He said, I'll never leave you. At my peace, I give you. The challenge is getting that truth from our heads to our hearts because it's in our hearts where paradigms are formed. In other words, the things that we believe is set in our hearts. And so God wants to get the knowledge of him to the understanding And we are able then to walk in peace. Isaiah 26, 3 and 4 says, You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord, the Lord himself, is the rock eternal. You see, Psalm 46 and 10, it says, He says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. The very presence of God. You see, the challenge we face is the ability then to be still. A fellow by the name of Manuel Pascal said, All of man's problems come from his ability to sit still. And I think it's true. We are always on the go, aren't we? That's been part of the problem with this COVID-19. It's a restriction that we haven't been able to be out and about like we normally have been. But when the stress and tension is reduced in our lives, then our spirits are lifted up. Depression, anxiety, fear all stem much from the stress in our lives. Cast all our cares upon Jesus, and he will give you peace. The third thing, this one seems so obvious, ask for God's help. We don't need to face the stress of life alone. Worry is one of the greatest robbers of peace. The fear of lack or not having enough will put so much pressure that sometimes it is difficult to cope. That is why God wants us to ask for his provision. Philippians 4, 4 4-7 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So when we ask God for his presence, when we ask him of what we to do, God's peace will guard our hearts. This is a military term. Because we are facing a battle that is for your soul. If the enemy of your soul can get you distracted, then he can take your peace. But God is never worried. To access it, we must ask and submit to God's leading. I saw a bumper sticker that says, No God, no peace. But no God and no peace. English is a strange language, isn't it? Some seem to be spared from the storm, but that is not the case. Some go through the middle of it, and they don't seem to be affected because they have learned who cares for them. God provides for us in different ways. He treats us all the same, but accommodating for our progress towards him. We need to hang on to what he provides, knowing that how we handle the little, then he can entrust us for the greater. 
So be faithful with what you have and reap that reward of peace. Because when you know God, you will know peace. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit. And in our society today, it's probably one of the more essential uh, truths of the Spirit that we need. Not just for us, but our family, for those around us. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you first of all for your presence. Lord, it said that you would be with us constantly and that you would never leave us or forsake us. And so, God, even though we are here, when we leave, you'll still go with us. That is an amazing thing to us. But, Lord, there is something that is special about when we all gather together and we sense you here. And for people in their home, I just pray, God, that they would sense your presence as well. And that, God, that they would know you. That, Father, that their hearts would be open to receive the truth about who you are, that it was explained in, the, in your word, and that, Lord, that that truth would set them free so that they could live in the abundance that you intended for them, that they could live in peace. So thank you, God, that you are with us. Thank you, Lord, that you hear us and that you answer prayer. Thank you, Father, that your name, your name, the name above every name. That it's in the name of Jesus that I proclaim peace over this congregation. It's in the name of Jesus that I declare healing and into the homes and into the lives of people. That, Father, that your heart and your mind would be ours and that, Lord, you would help us to walk in the truth that you've given to us. And it doesn't matter whether you're 90 or 9, that, Father, this truth would set people free. So, Lord, I pray for children. I pray for young adults. I pray for young people. I pray for, for middle-aged folks that have kids. I pray, God, that your hand would be upon them, that you'd bring peace into their homes, peace into relationships between husbands and wives that have been stressed. And that, Lord, for seniors who are locked in, that, Lord, we just pray that you would be with them and that you'd keep them strong, keep them healthy, and that your peace would be there. In Jesus' name, amen.